Hello. So uh, President Biden's just given his State of the Union speech. Um, it's been called his first State of the Union, I guess. I'm trying to recall it must have been um, uh, taken off last year because of COVID. I'm trying to recall because his first. I would have thought this was his second. Anyway, um, CNN's just crunching down the numbers and percentages and so on, as they always do. And tonight, um, Kiev and Kharkiv... Uh, I I should pronounce it Kiev. Actually, that's an important issue in all of this. Uh, the Russian and Ukrainian pronunciation of the cities. Um, but there's one subject I want to talk about. I thought this would make a good subject for the video. Why is it that some conflicts get more coverage than others? Because the issue was brought up that um, there's a Western bias towards Ukraine. Um. Well, there's a lot of talking points around that. Um, firstly, let's look at the facts. Um, this is a conflict that's fresh. True, the low-level insurgency has been going on in the low-level conflict, I should say, has been going on in the Donbass region since 2015. 2014-15, um, Ukraine was again in the headlines for the obvious reason then. Then it became a low-level conflict, and once again, this has really escalated. Um, of course, it's a major story, because it involves Russia, which is a major power. Um, so that in itself is one reason why it's a major story. Another reason is it involves NATO, because it's bordering NATO countries. Um, and the other reason is that this has happened in a few days. You have a humanitarian crisis that has, has broken out. You have urban warfare. Um, casualties, as is ever in these situations, there's no exact figure. Um, depending on the source you look at, um, 200 civilian dead so far, 352. Um, Russian casualties, the Ukrainians have set up to 4,500. That's probably an exaggeration. But I wouldn't be surprised if it's heavy. Um, and, you know, the Russian side are never uh, clean about their casualty figures. They're never honest about the casualty figures. They're, you know, I felt, I feel that Russia's always treated as soldiers like a commodity. Maybe argue that with any country, but I think it's particularly true of Russia. I mean, in Chechnya and Afghanistan, Soviet and Russian troops died in, in their thousands. And those figures were withheld at home. Um, so it is possible that thousands of Russians have died in Ukraine. I think it's probably more like hundreds. Um, Ukrainian military casualties, I haven't seen figures on that. But uh, I think when all the figures are analysed, probably the median sort of figure we're looking at at this point is well over a thousand casualties. Um, so it's proving to be a bloody conflict. Now, if we look at other wars around the world, this isn't the only conflict going on in the world today. There's Yemen. There's still the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, Syria is winding down, but it's by no means over. Um, Burma, the internal conflict in Burma is raging on. Um, there's many, many low intensity conflicts around the world. If you look at Wikipedia, ongoing conflicts, it kind of gives you an indicator of this. Drug war in Mexico. Um, there's numerous conflicts on the African continent, the biggest of which is one I want to talk about, the Grey War. Now, in that conflict, uh, which is the deadliest conflict so far of the 2020s, upwards of 50,000 people have died since 2020. Um, so why does it get a lot less focus? Well, it's been going on for two years. Uh, but even when it broke out, it didn't get that much coverage. So is that because, oh, well, it's just another Africa conflict, the West doesn't care? A cynical mind might be tempted to look at that. But actually, if you look at the situation, President Abiy Ahmed, former Nobel laureate, now uh, very much disgraced, um, you know, I would say it's a real fall from grace given his his role in that war. Um has heavily restricted media access. And he's went on wild conspiracy theories about 
you know, condemnation of Ethiopian forces. He's claimed it's a racist conspiracy against black Africans. And he's basically coming out with the sort of narrative that um, African dictators of the past came out with. And this is a guy who is hailed, you know, as a Nobel laureate. So it's sad to see him resort to that. But the reason that T. Gray doesn't get the same level of attention is simply because journalists don't have access on the ground, or at least not sufficient access. They can access some parts of the country, but um, access is heavily restricted. I think, um, like many conflicts, there's been atrocities on both sides. Um, but it is true that it doesn't directly involve any great power, and that probably is also a factor as to why it gets less focus. Um, now, if the Tigray war broke out today, would it get attention with what's happening in Ukraine? If we're being honest, probably not the same amount. But I also think, you know, it's too easy blaming the media. Uh, this line, well, it's the fault of the media. A Vietnamese friend of mine, um, you know, she had a post, and it was in Vietnamese, but I knew it was about Ukraine because of the photo captions. Um, and I, I def my comment that I'm 100 behind Ukraine, and she said, "Oh, my my government's neutral, and therefore so am I." And um, she got into this thing about, "Well, do you think the media is manipulated?" Um, here's the thing, you know, blaming the media is just too easy. I think um, every media out that has bias, and of course, Western outlets are going to be using emotive images like the little girl who was killed with her parents fleeing the country of course is going to be propaganda in that sense but that doesn't mean that there's a moral equivalency it doesn't mean that because both sides are using propaganda that propaganda is of the same proportion or the same level of dishonesty propaganda doesn't mean dishonesty it just means that you're taking something from a certain angle now, Russia's lives have been plain to see. They said they weren't going to invade, and they did. I mean, it couldn't be more obvious. But before people talk about um, Western bias, you know, you need to look at the context. Take China, for example. The Chinese often complain of Western media bias, but they won't allow um, transparency. So you can't say, I mean, I think of, for example, coverage of disasters that have happened. Um, Western outlets will be accused of making China look bad, but then Chinese officials will prevent Western journalists from accessing, um, say, an earthquake zone or another area that is story um, in order to interview people, in order to try and get a picture. You can't condemn people for not showing the whole picture if they're not given access to the whole picture. Um, so that's what's absurd about that argument. It's, you know, if journalists aren't given access to a story, then they can't be accused of not showing the whole picture. I think the exception to that rule is when you have an out that is part of a, um, of a government, as RT, in my opinion, is. I mean, I think RT is effectively a branch of the Russian government. Um, what's my evidence of that? Well, you need, just need to look into its origins. This was founded by Russian ultra-nationalists. Margarita Simonian um, hasn't, you know, been shy about her politics. Um, Ofcom absurdly claims it's, uh, it's just showing the Russian perspective, but it's there's basically no difference between RT and the Kremlin. In its entire history, RT has never, ever condemned Putin. Not once. So whilst you can accuse outlets like CNN and the BBC of bias, you simply cannot say it's the same situation. You cannot say that the BBC told the British government's official line. Why? Because BBC journalists regularly question the government. So it's just disingenuous. These, these false equivalencies need to be challenged. And finally, about the situation in Ukraine, of course, Europeans are going to be interested. It's our continent. Europe's quite a small continent. You know, we're smaller than at least three countries, China, Russia, and Canada. 
we're the world's second smallest continent. So what happens in one country is going to reverberate across the continent, particularly when there are real fears this could expand. So it's a bit absurd expecting people in the UK or Germany or Slovakia not to be interested in what's happening in Ukraine, because it isn't that far away. But personally, um, because of my interest in current affairs, because I'm a man of the world, of friends all over the world, I'm interested in what happens all over the world. It happens to be a major story. Not just because it's happening in Europe, because it's involving a major, major power in Russia. Now, if Russia was to suddenly attack an African country or an Asian country, that too would be a major story because it's involving Russia. So, you know, there, there shouldn't be any confusion as to why this is a major story or um, contention for that matter. Headline now is reading, Putin met wall of strength. I'll just show you the headline. I mean, it's important to remember this is just seven days old, like seven days old. Um, it might well be that further down the line, in fact, there's a risk. There's actually a risk that people will get tired of hearing about Ukraine. And this will become a background story. I hope it doesn't. Because I think it's a major issue. Um, but the reason it's a major story is because it is a major story. And um, I think people just need to look at the context of these things because there's a lot of false equivalency and a lot of ignoring context 